Hello once again. In this mini lecture, we're going to go over the, and answer the question, why does the sun shine? So the sun is hot, and because it's hot, it's radiating energy. And if the sun did not have a source of energy, as it radiates that light away, it would cool off. Just as if you have a hot stove and you turn off the burner, the burner will cool off over time as it radiates its energy away. So if you want to keep the sun hot, you need a source of energy. So we'll start this mini lecture by talking about some ways that we know the sun does not have energy and use that to um, use that reasoning to lead us to why we now think that the sun um, uses nuclear reactions to determine what's going on in the core. So we'll start with some silly, with a silly idea. Could the sun possibly be on fire? You know, in old days, uh, in Greek myths, the sun was a chariot of fire moving across the sky, and we often draw it as a yellow ball with flames coming off of it. Uh, so, could it be on fire? Well, I mean, we know, okay, we know there's no oxygen in space, and you need oxygen for fire to work. But just play along with me here. If the sun were, say, a big piece of wood that were on fire we could estimate how long the sun would live. We know how much energy comes out of burning wood. We know how big the sun is. So if the sun were a big piece of wood or a big uh, tank of gasoline or a big piece of charcoal, something that would burn, we can calculate how much energy a sun-sized lump of coal or a sun-sized tank of gas would contain. And then we know what the sun's energy output is. We saw that in the first mini lecture, 4 times 10 to the 26 watts. So if we know the total energy content of the sun and how fast it's radiating light away, we can figure out how long the sun would last with that source of energy. And if you had a sun-sized piece of wood and were burning it at a rate fast enough for the, uh, to produce the energy that we see from the sun, you would, the sun would only last for 10,000 years. We know there have been humans on Earth. We have records of civilizations long, uh, older than 10,000 years. So therefore, we know that the sun is not being powered by regular fire. Of course, there are other reasons we know that. But uh, one reason alone would be the time scale. So one of the ideas that came up in the uh, 17 and 1800s for what might be powering the sun would be that the sun is shrinking over time. As we mentioned in the last mini lecture, if you have a gas and you squeeze it, it will heat up. And um, if so if the sun is being squeezed by gravity, it heats up, it then would radiate that heat away and cool off, and then gravity would try and squeeze it some more which would heat it back up and it could radiate that off so gravity could squeeze it some more so it would do, be this constant squeezing due to gravity and then that energy radiating off into space. So again we can calculate what the uh, total energy content you can get out of a sun shrinking due to gravitational contraction is and it turns out to be that the sun could be powered for about 25 million years and in the 17 and 1800s when this idea was popular um, it, we didn't know of anything on the Earth that old, and so this seemed like a completely plausible idea. However, uh, in the late 1800s and in the 1900s, as we learned ways of dating uh, rocks by radioactivity and other methods, we found that the Earth was around three and a half billion years old at least. The oldest meteorites we find are four and a half billion years old. And when we look at the three and a half billion year old rocks on the Earth, we see evidence that there was life in the form of bacteria and algae at that time. And algae get their energy from the sun, from photosynthesis. So gravitational contraction is not sufficient to power the sun uh, for four and a half billion years. So therefore, we can rule out gravitational contraction. There are other ways we can rule it out, too. I mean, we can actually just watch the sun. We know how fast it would have to be shrinking, and we've been watching it now for um, a good hundred or so years, very precise measurements, and the sun is not changing its size. So we know that gravitational contraction of the sun is not what is powering the sun. In the early 1900s, uh, the concept of nuclear energy began to be determined when Einstein came up with this equation that energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared, E equals mc squared. 
Uh, and what that equation means is that you can take matter and if you can turn that matter into pure energy, the amount of energy you get out is the mass, the total amount that you're changing into energy, times the speed of light squared. Speed of light's really big, squaring it, it's far bigger, so a little bit of mass produces a lot of energy. And in the early 1900s, it was hypothesized that you could create um, energy by nuclear means. And if you calculate how long the sun will last due to nuclear fusion, you get roughly 10 billion years, which is a good long nap for Homer. Uh, and also, 10 billion years is longer than the Earth and meteorites have been around. So this seems like a very reasonable explanation for why the sun would continue to shine. So let's examine nuclear fusion in a little more detail. We'll talk about how it occurs, what the process is, and then in the next mini lecture we'll talk about how that energy gets from the middle of the sun where the fusion happens to the outside of the sun where we can see it, and in that same mini lecture we will also talk about how we are certain that nuclear fusion is going on inside the sun. So for the rest of this mini lecture, we're going to focus on how nuclear fusion occurs in the sun. There are two ways, two types of nuclear reactions you can have and get energy. If you have a very massive nucleus, like uranium or plutonium, uh, you can split that into two smaller atoms that are still fairly massive, and that releases some energy. This is called fission. Nuclear fission is the way that we get nuclear energy on the Earth right now. All the nuclear reactors around us use nuclear fission to get energy. So you take a big atom, you split it, you get some energy out. There's another way you can get uh, energy from nuclear reactions, and that's called nuclear fusion. And fusion, if you take two small atoms and smash them together and get them to stick, that can release energy, and that's the way that the sun gets energy. Uh, so you can imagine if we have a lar if we can split a large atom and get energy, or if we can smash two small atoms together and get energy, then there's somewhere in between where we can neither get energy uh, from fission nor could we get energy from fusion. And that happens to happen at for the iron for the element iron. So therefore, iron is often called the most stable element because you can't do nuclear reactions with it and to get energy out. So the reason that the sun does nuclear fusion is because it is made mostly of hydrogen. At the very high temperatures at the center of the sun, uh, the hydrogen atoms, the electrons, are ionized. They leave the atom. And so you have left the atomic nucleus of hydrogen, which is a proton. So a proton has a positive charge, and if you take two protons at room temperature and try and push them together by nuclear fusion, their positive charges, like charges, repel, and so that electric charge will, will repel them. They'll try to come close together, and then they'll slow down and stop and then move back apart again. However, if you speed them up faster and higher temperatures are um, mean that the gas is moving faster, so if we heat it up, the protons will be moving faster, and they can come closer before they come to a stop and fly apart. Heat it up more, they'll come even closer. And finally, if you get the temperature up to at least 4 million Kelvin, then they will be moving fast enough that before they have a chance to come to a stop and fly apart, atomic forces grab onto each other, and they will fuse together and release energy. Now, the sun's central temperature is 15 million Kelvin, so it's plenty hot for this fusion to happen. The overall picture of how the sun fuses uh, hydrogen into helium is that you start with four protons and uh, you go through a series of processes which we'll talk about in the next slide and at the end of the day you have a helium nucleus and a lot of energy plus some subatomic particles. So when you do this fusion obviously if you start with four protons and you end up with helium, helium is two protons and two neutrons. So you have to turn two of your protons, which have positive charges, into neutrons, which have no charge. And you can't just make charge disappear. So when, the, when two protons turn into two neutrons, you need it, something with a positive charge. And that thing is called a positron. 
A positron, it's like an electron, except it has a positive charge. And in fact, it's what we call antimatter. So you have positrons, which are antimatter electrons. And if a positron runs into an electron, and there are lots of electrons around in the middle of the sun, uh, antimatter and matter, when they collide, they annihilate and release energy in the form of gamma rays. So a positron is produced by fusion. It flies out. It'll find an electron, annihilate it, and release some energy. During these steps that lead to helium, you also end up just releasing gamma rays by the fact that energy is released. And finally, you end up with a couple of ghostly particles called neutrinos. You may never have heard of neutrinos before. Neutrinos are very low mass particles. They have no electric charge. And they also don't interact with most of the ordinary matter around us. They don't interact with electrons or protons or neutrons very readily. And so a neutrino can fly through a light year of lead before it would run into a, a lead a nucleus and interact. So neutrinos, when they are produced, they just fly right out of the sun. Uh, nothing holds them there, and they come out. The positrons uh, annihilate with electrons and make gamma rays. The gamma rays are themselves released there by the same fusion reaction, and you end up with helium. So if you want to put this in terms of a recipe, you would need to start with four protons, and you crank your oven temperature up to four million Kelvin, and what you get out at the end of a series of reactions is a helium nucleus, so two protons, two nu uh, neutrons all stuck together. You would end up with two gamma rays from the nuclear reactions, two positrons, which would then annihilate two electrons and make two more gamma rays, so four gamma rays overall, and then two of these neutrinos that zip right out of the sun. And if you add up all the mass that you start with, you add up the mass of four protons, and then you add up the mass of all the stuff that comes out at the end, all the uh, neutrinos and positrons and uh, helium nucleus, the total mass at the end is almost 1% lower than the total mass of the four protons. Where did that go? That turned into energy by E equals mc squared. Now on the Earth, if we do a nuclear reaction like fusion, we tend to get a runaway and end up with a nuclear bomb. So why doesn't the sun shred itself when it's doing all this fusion? And the reason is because the sun can regulate itself. It has its own little internal thermostat that works to uh, keep the fusion reactions from running away too fast or to keep them, speed them back up if they get too slow. So what happens if fusion gets too fast, then those extra, if too many fusion reactions happen, it releases extra energy. That energy heats up the core of the sun. And as we, uh, if you remember from your ideal gas laws that we talked about in the last mini lecture, if you heat up a gas, its pressure increases. And the sun is finely balanced. Again, remember, gravity is trying to pull it in. Pressure is trying to push it out. So the pressure goes up. That's going to push the sun outward a little bit and increase its volume very slightly. Well, if you increase the volume of a gas, you lower the temperature. So the temperature goes down. And when the temperature goes down, that means all the gas particles are moving more slowly, so you don't have as many fusion reactions. So if fusion happens too fast, the gas expands, cools off, and then the fusion reaction slows down, and you get back into your nice little sweet spot. If fusion happens too slow, then you're not releasing enough energy. Energy is leaving the sun, so the core begins to cool off very slightly that cool gas doesn't have as much pressure as the hotter gas did so gravity will begin to win the day and begin to squeeze the gas of the sun inward and when you squeeze the gas you raise the temperature raising the temperature increases the speed of the particles so more fusion happens that releases more energy and you again get back to your nice sweet spot so the sun self-regulates if fusion happens too fast it'll slow itself down if fusion happens too slow it'll speed itself back up and that's why the sun has remained stable for four and a half billion years, producing uh, a nice stable amount of energy so we don't freeze one day and cook the next. So the summary of how fusion works. At the core of the sun, the temperature and it turns out the density are just right for nuclear fusion to happen. And again, this is fusion where two atoms combine and stick together they fuse together to make a larger atom. 
and the overall reaction is that you begin with four hydrogen atoms which are protons they fuse into a helium atom and in that process they release two positrons two bits of antimatter that go out annihilate regular matter and make energy you also release two gamma rays that are also just energy and you release two of these ghostly particles called neutrinos that fly right out of the sun because they don't interact much with normal matter and the sun is finely balanced so that gravity and pressure act as a thermostat to regulate the rate of fusion so you don't have a runaway and the sun doesn't explode as a bomb or you don't have fusion go out and then the sun collapse in on itself so that's all we have in this mini lecture in the next mini lecture we will go on and talk about um, the interior of the sun how the sun gets the energy from fusion out to the outside and then also how we are absolutely positive what proof we have that fusion is going on in the center of the sun.